The following program is classified M. It contains some violence. Channel 10 recommends viewing by mature audiences. To you, the viewers of Wanted, thank you. Thank you for the information you give us. 13 arrests so far and a missing girl found. Thank you, Wanted, for helping to find my daughter. Now we need your help to catch the cowards who killed. We're treating this as being a serious crime. Who left this young man for dead? This family needs your help. Watch your child die and part of you dies too. Also, dramatic new clues in the hunt for the car park gunman. <laughs> Plus, the exclusive CCTV police want you to see. A terrifying armed robbery. They say if I'm not open the safe, they kill me. Identify these men and solve the crime. There are people that are dealing with these offenders on a daily basis. Your call can make the difference. Tonight on Wanted. Welcome to a special live edition of Wanted. Tonight, we're taking you into the heart of the biggest Crime Stopper call centre in Australia. Sandra, I'm on the central coast of New South Wales at Tugra. Now here, and at Crime Stoppers call centres right across the country, there are teams of specialist operators who are ready to take your calls. Now, thanks to you, we've already been able to help police in a number of very important cases, and we appeal again tonight. If you see something, please say something. That's our motto. Now, no matter how trivial you think it might be, your call to Crime Stoppers could be the vital clue that helps solve a crime. And this is the first case we need your help with. The continuing hunt for two gunmen who ambushed a man in a car park in Sydney's West in May this year. Now, the victim was hit at close range by four bullets, but remarkably survived to tell his story. We can now reveal more about the crime and the gunman who police are working hard to track down. Neil Mercer has the latest. What you are hearing is a gunman on his way to a shooting in Sydney. He's quoting the Koran. There's actually what we believe is a prayer where the fellow who's, who's driving the car is actually praying that he gets away with the offence, that the witness's eyes are shielded from, um, from the uh, crime he's about to commit. The gunman's prayers weren't answered on two fronts. One, unbeknown to him, his voice was recorded on a small GoPro camera mounted in the front of a van he'd just stolen. Two, CCTV vision from outside a nightclub in the Sydney suburb of Rydalmere captures the shooting of a man we'll call Max in graphic detail. One of the shots had hit me in the foot, so I went to the ground. More shots were fired. Shot me another three times. Uh, uh, help, let me in! Uh, I heard they the shot me in the foot, the, um, the liver, the, the groin and the lung. The gunman ran off, leaving Max for dead. So what we now know is that Max is shot outside the nightclub about 11.30pm on May the 1st this year. One bullet misses his heart by millimetres. More than three months later, the two assailants are still wanted. Tonight, we can reveal that police have fresh evidence which might help identify the shooters. This vision obtained by Wanted shows the stolen vehicles in convoy on their way to the crime. And there's new audio of their voices just before the shooting. Yeah, 
Police have also released pictures of the burnt-out getaway vehicle. A silver 1998 Nissan Pulsar. Well, Max is a very lucky man. When, when you've got four bullets passing through your body and you survive it, you, you, you're a lucky man. Yeah, God put his hand on me that night. You know, I mean, I just... Um, it's just amazing. We're joined by the officer leading the hunt for the gunman, Detective Inspector Steve Patton. And Inspector, how callous, how, uh, how would you describe those gunmen? It was a brutal attack, Neil, a cowardly. Uh, this fellow was just going about his business. He was set upon, he was shot, he was kicked and beaten, and he didn't fight back. And we've heard the, uh, them speaking in Arabic. Uh, now we've got a little bit of English. How useful is that for you? Oh, it's a, it's a great clue, Neil. Uh, we expect that there'll be people out there that recognise these voices, and we urge them to uh, give us a call. And how unique is it to get something like that? Which it was caught on the on the camera, of course. How unique is that? Oh, it's certainly unusual, and that these um, these people weren't aware that they were being recorded at the time, obviously. And members of the public have phoned in with information. Give us some idea of what you've got. Oh, look, we have some information, and we're following some we're following some leads. Um, but we'd like um, we believe there's people out there who know who these people are. Um, we'd like them to give us a call. As these people, I mean, they need to uh, be off the streets. And, and also a Nissan Pulsar, that's the getaway vehicle. You found that burnt out. What would you say to anybody who saw that? Well, anyone who's seen that car or, or who, who is aware of anyone who may have stolen that car or they saw the vehicle being dumped, we urge them to give us a call as well. All right. Detective Inspector, thanks very much. Thanks, Neil. Well, gun crime is a national problem, but the spate of shootings in Sydney has led New South Wales Police this week to launch a new strategy to tackle gun violence in the state. Former Detective Superintendent Terry Dalton went back to his old stomping ground to investigate this fresh initiative in the fight against armed criminals. Occasions like this are pivotal events for our police forces across Australia. The day new recruits are sworn in. And the top brass turn up in all their brave. For New South Wales Police, this graduation of 160 recruits in Goulburn is especially important. It's a week they're making a show of force against gun crime. For anyone who is contemplating or is using weapons illegally in the streets or shooting at houses in the middle of the night, you need to know it is a criminal act and we're be coming for you. Since Wanted's gun special last week, there have been even more cases allegedly involving illicit firearms. Two men arguing, then a loud bang. On Monday, in outer Melbourne, a man was shot dead, allegedly following an argument after a burglary. On Tuesday, police raided a house in Sydney South and found this alarming array of weapons, including hand grenades, guns, gas masks, hundreds of rounds of ammunition and a landmine. In Western Sydney, police arrested a 19-year-old in connection with a shooting on Wednesday night. The problems with guns and drive-by shootings are obviously prominent in Sydney and New South Wales. We're constantly looking for ways to do things better. To do things better, police have changed tactics and restructured the force. There are a number of different strike forces and operations who have done really, really good work over the last 12 months or so, but this is an attempt by us to amalgamate all of those efforts and put them under one commander, one person. Operation Talon will bring together police intelligence, investigations under one hat. We will be out there in force, in numbers, we will have police targeting hotspots, and we aim to claim the ascendancy again. People who do these sorts of things, who are willing to use guns in public places and willing to shoot guns into houses and so on, they're criminals, they're nothing but criminals. As the illicit gun supply begins to dry up, criminals are turning to homemade weapons, like these machine guns grabbed from a bikey gang. They're also stealing legal weapons. In Panola, South Australia, these guns were stored legally in a gun safe. It took several hours with an angle grinder and a jemmy to get at them. 
Police have released this CCTV footage of a tradeback Hilux seen driving through town on Friday the 9th of August. It's white with a distinctive black snorkel. What message do you have for gangsters out there who want to run around the streets of Sydney firing guns into houses and shooting at each other? We will be out there in force, in numbers. We will have police targeting hotspots based on information and intelligence and we'll be going harder than we ever have before. A lot of people don't realise is that one call to Crime Stoppers could lead to a $1,000 reward, not just for guns, but for all criminal activity. So you know what to do. Make the call. And to Wanted and all the viewers who have helped by providing information, we simply say thank you for everything you've done so far. Look forward to getting a lot more good results with the information you give us. Now to developments in a murder we covered in recent weeks. Sydney racing identity Les Samba was shot dead in Melbourne in February 2011. We can now reveal that two men who police wanted to interview have come forward as a result of appearing on Wanted. They've been interviewed by police and are not suspects. But this is an image of the man police believe shot Les Samba. And if you have any information about this murder, please come forward. Stay with us on Wanted. Coming up, police need your help finding the cowards who kill. You watch your child die and part of you dies too. Drivers who leave hit and run victims for dead. It's a criminal investigation into his death. Um, we're treating this as being a serious crime. But next on Wanted, exclusive video capturing an armed robbery from its calculated beginning to its terrifying end. They say if I'm not open a safe, they kill me. You're with Wanted, coming to you in part tonight from one of the biggest Crime Stoppers call centres in the country. I'm at Tagra on the New South Wales Central Coast and already your calls are starting to come through on tonight's cases. We will have an update shortly. But now to an investigation that will give you a remarkable and exclusive insight into a violent armed robbery. Victorian police have released security video from a gaming venue right in the heart of Melbourne. Now, you'll see the heist unfold step by step, and it was meticulously planned to case police believe the public can help solve. Swanston Street, in the heart of Melbourne. On February 18 this year, nightfall brings a very welcome cool change after a record-breaking six-day heatwave. And finally, the people of Melbourne are able to get a good night's sleep. And as it's a Monday, these now very busy city streets will eventually fall quiet. But by 2am on Tuesday the 19th, a pair of cool and very calculated thieves are wide awake and they're about to make their move on this popular gaming venue. The men are almost outside the venue when four women walk towards them. The men avert their gaze. What these young women don't know is that the men are concealing a baton and a knife. Several metres beyond the entrance, they stop and head back. One of them takes a call on his mobile, but they're not yet ready to enter. From what we're able to understand, there's been a lot of preparation, a lot of planning that's gone into this because they've known the operating hours of the venue. They've clearly known about the movements of some of the staff. So you're confident then that these men went there capable of and prepared for violence? Absolutely. At 1.49am, the men enter the Black Opal gaming room through a cafe which has already closed. Downstairs, patrons are still playing the poker machines. So, Matt, once they've come in through this cafe area, what, what was their next move? Well, they haven't gone to the pokey area. Uh, instead, they've gone straight up the stairs to the cocoon bar. Up here? Yep, that's right. So this area was generally open to the public at that time of night? Yep, management had left this open for the public to utilise the toilets. Yeah. So, yeah, they've made their way up here, which effectively is a restaurant area and there was, it was open to the public, but there was nobody dining in here at, this, at that time of night. Completely empty that yep. time. And as they've come through the venue, it would appear that they've been aware of the cameras. 
They're still disguised at this stage with their hoodies. There's no sign of any weapons. The men know exactly where to hide. So, Matt, they've come in through here, and this is effectively the air conditioning or maintenance yeah, room. that's isn't right, it? yep. And this is where they've walked in, and for almost two hours, where they've stood and waited. It's now nearly 4 a.m. For 115 minutes, the men have waited patiently. The black opal is long closed. The patrons have all left. The doors are locked. The takings are being counted by Alec, an employee in the strong room. This is the first time police have released this video. When we're closing, then I just took the money to the safe room. Then when I done the halfway, then I hear someone knocking the door. When I saw them, I think it's staff member joking with me. I think it's happened in the movie, but not in my life. The men threaten Alec with a knife and a baton. They demand he open the safe. They say, if I'm not open the safe, they kill me. I just say, you can take anything. What do you want? I lost the energy. I just sit down on the floor. I don't know how to explain. It's very, very scared. Just I worry my life lost. And uh, who can look after my mother if I'm gone? Alec can't open the safe, but gives them the cash he's counting, a huge sum of money. But the terror isn't over yet. They type my mouth and uh, type my hand and type my feet. One of the men spots the CCTV camera, using his knife to move the focus off them. Leaving Alec helpless, tied up and terrified, the thieves leave the strong room and use a fire exit to make their escape. Security cameras continue to watch their every step. The bandits casually saunter away through a car park and laneway. Their haul in a green bag slung over a shoulder. Alec breaks free of the tape and calls the police. But six months on, he's still traumatised by the attack and can no longer continue working at the venue. Now I very hard to sleep in the night. I also need the medicine help, but still very hard to sleep in. And in my dream, always someone robbed me, someone tried to kill me. Just how important to you is it, Alec, that, that these people be taken off the streets? I'm very angry. I want, I want the police can catch them quickly. Perhaps you saw these men in the early hours of February the 19th. Or are you one of the women who walked past? Do you know these men, described as Indian in appearance and aged in their 20s? There are people that are dealing with these offenders on a daily basis who would have seen, you know, um, uh, unexplained wealth that they've come into possession of or who may recognise the clothing or may have some information about it and what we're appealing to them is to, to come forward and speak to Crime Stoppers or make direct contact with the police. And of course, if you have any information about that crime, you know who to contact and you can do it anonymously. After the break, Left for Dead, the police campaign to hunt down hit and run drivers and how new forensic tests could provide vital evidence. So it's quite possible that the driver or the passenger has received an injury uh, as a result of the collision that caused the death in this particular instance. You always wanted. Well, it can be a dangerous business being a pedestrian in Australia. Every year, around 3,000 pedestrians are hospitalised after being hit by cars. Some estimates put the number of victims of hit and runs as high as 10%. Few crimes are more cowardly, and police are seeking your help hunting down those drivers who hit and then run. Now, in their sights is the driver involved in this hit and run on the Gold Coast on May 14. The dramatic footage shows a Japanese tourist being knocked over on Surface Paradise Boulevard. 25-year-old Nobuo Subaki is thrown about 10 metres. 
He was knocked unconscious, but miraculously only suffered cuts and bruising. Joining us now is the officer investigating the case, Senior Sergeant Jim Monkton on the Gold Coast. And Senior Sergeant, it's extraordinary footage and it looks like the driver made no effort to stop. Uh, that's right, Sandra. Uh, as the driver's uh, turned on to uh, Surface Paradise Boulevard, they've uh, collided with the pedestrian and uh, haven't made any attempt to stop. They've then gone on to run a red light, I understand. Yes, that's correct. They've uh, then turned left into uh, Clifford Street, um, again without stopping for the red light. So what leads do you have so far? Uh, today we've um, reviewed some uh, um, CCTV footage and also uh, interviewed a number of witnesses. Um, however, we've been able to uh, not identify the, uh, the driver or the vehicle, and dri or vehicle involved at this time. In this instance, would smash repairers and panel beaters be of some assistance? Yes, it would, because there could be some damage to the, uh, the front of the vehicle or the bonnet of the vehicle. We've canvassed a number of uh, local smash repair businesses um, without success today. Senior Sergeant, thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, now to another hit and run, this time with fatal consequences. 34-year-old Don Stambolis was walking home in Melbourne after a night out when he was knocked down and killed by the driver of a stolen car. Now, police have spent over two decades trying to solve this crime, but finally believe they are edging closer to finding the culprit. Our forensic scientist, Dr Xanthi Mallet, investigates. Sometimes the most normal places can be the scenes of the most terrible crimes. In suburban Preston, just 10 kilometres north of Melbourne CBD, one of those crimes played out 24 years ago. Here on Spring Street, there's always a steady flow of evening traffic. At 10.45pm on the 28th of October 1989, it really didn't look much different than how it looks this evening. On his Saturday night off, printer John Stambolis spends the evening having a few drinks with a mate. This 1990 Crime Stoppers reenactment shows John heading down Spring Street. I'm across the road from the spot John was walking 24 years ago with Detective Acting Senior Sergeant Damien Madden, who's reinvestigating the case. We've got um, three vehicles that were travelling south on Spring Street, so just uh, behind us here, one of those vehicles was travelling at high speed. That same vehicle had just screamed off from a traffic light about 500 metres down the street. John's actually trying to uh, cross the road towards our location. The next steps John takes would be his last. We've got about 30 metres of skid that start just up here. Uh, he's been projected some 23 metres down the road uh, in the gutter area. That's a long way. It is a very long way, yeah. John was struck with such violent force, one of his shoes was flung 55 metres from where his body was found. From our perspective, that shows high speed, sort of around the 90 to 93 kilometres an hour. The statesman sped off. As police would soon discover, it was a stolen car. Gaspar Ruotolo was in his 20s at the time. He, his wife and two friends were travelling in a maroon Gemini when the statesman containing two men sped past them well before the traffic lights. When the lights turned green, the statesman took off, followed by a white car. At first, Gaspar didn't realise the statesman had struck a person. The driver of the white car behind the statesman didn't stop and has never come forward. Years on, Gaspar still remembers arriving moments after John was hit. A friend of mine beside me said that there was a, a body on the road and that's when we decided to do a, a U-turn and uh, we came back and we're on the opposite side of the road and then we saw a body on the ground and basically looking like he's dead. Yeah, it was just a, it was just a shock. It never goes away, does it? 24 years ago. No, that's not something that's, uh, yeah, easy to forget, yeah. yeah. Well, we're talking death here, so how can you forget something like that? Yeah. the Silver Statesman and its two male occupants sped off up the road. John Stambolis was already dead. 
he'd suffered fatal head injuries. But there were vital clues left behind. Their value, unrealised back then, but today, investigated gold. Several streets away, the stolen statesman is found, dumped. Police then discover bloodstains. But not just John Stambolas's blood. They find blood inside the car belonging to someone else. So it's quite possible that the driver or the passenger has received an injury uh, as a result of the collision that caused the death in this particular instance. Investigators are about to conduct tests, which, after all this time, could finally identify the perpetrators. So, Xanthi, tell us about these DNA samples they found inside the car. Two full profiles were found inside the car, and they believe that these occurred through injury at the time of the accident. So they belong to the driver and, and passenger in the car, and they can absolutely identify them. What's different now, then, is the DNA they had before essentially ruled out any information, but now they have new DNA, and if someone comes forward, they can be nailed. Well, back in 1989, when the samples were originally collected, they could be DNA typed, but they couldn't give you a full profile, and that's really what's changed. So they could be exclusionary previously, but now if we have a name, we can actually definitively say it is their DNA, and they can serve justice for, you know, this heinous crime. In essence, though, these two people have been living with this crime on their conscience for 24 years. Yeah, and I imagine that if, if you'd done this, you'd be aware that somebody had died. You know, this, is, this couldn't be more serious. So the family need closure, and they mm. probably have spoken to people so come forward give us their names and we can exclude them if they're not involved. Santi thanks very much looking forward to the developments next week. Stay with us plenty more ahead on Wanted including a midnight raid by bandits on a convenience store and more on the cowards who kill a 21 year old left for dead his family want justice. That's the one thing I wish for to go out and stand at Luke's grave and tell him I now know what happened. Welcome back. You're with Wanted. More now on the hit-and-run drivers and the victims they leave for dead. Another of those victims was 21-year-old Luke Shaw. He was left for dead in the middle of a Mildura road with fatal head injuries. Neil Mercer investigates a crime police have been trying to solve for eight years now and meets a family wanting answers. Every night across Australia in countless pubs and clubs, the same old story plays out. Young people getting together for a good time. But the mixture of alcohol, youth and cars can be a dangerous cocktail. Those elements came together one night in the town of Mildura. The victim on this occasion was 21-year-old Luke Shaw. You watch your child die and part of you dies too. Had his days. <laughs> An angel one day, a devil the next. <laughs> that's, that's Luke. <laughs> fishing, cray fishing, yabbying. He was excellent at it. <laughs> yeah. You could always bet that he'd bring you a feed home. He was a very outdoorsy boy from the word go. He loved to be outside building things, fixing things, and he'd always come in with grease on him and his bike pulled apart. Luke Shaw's love of the big outdoors might have stemmed from the fact there wasn't much room indoors. He was one of 11 children born to Glenn and Jenny. They were all there for his 21st birthday, his last. Three months later, he was gone. Hey, I'm going out. I'll crash the mass tonight. See you guys tomorrow. All right. You're safe, OK? Sure, Dad. Hi, Luke. He walked out the door. He said, see you tomorrow. But that didn't happen. About 10 p.m. on October 20, 2005, Luke Shaw arrives here at what was then O'Malley's Irish Tavern. This is CCTV from O'Malley's that night. O'Malley's was a, a fairly significant venue in the town at the time. Luke Shaw got there around about 10pm and stayed there uh, through the course of the evening until the early hours of the morning of the 21st of October, being a Friday. 
Luke Shaw is last seen about 2.30 a.m. on Mildura's main street. He's obviously been drinking, he's on foot, and he's headed in this direction. About 3.20 a.m., a security guard is on patrol in his car in 9th Street, 550 metres from where Luke was last seen. All of a sudden, he swerves to avoid a man lying on the road. He stops, he finds Luke. Somehow, the young man has suffered a massive head injury. Luke Shaw is barely alive. The dreaded five o'clock in the morning, knock on the door. Is it Brad or Luke? It's Luke. How bad? It's not good. He said that Luke had, had been found lying in a pool of blood in Mildura on the road and uh, he's been taken to hospital. They assumed Luke had been hit by a car because he was lying on the road and he asked me did I know who he was with that night um, because no one was with him when he was found. We cannot understand why he was walking down 9th Street. What he w was doing in that location it just baffles us. It was the start of both a tragedy and a mystery. Luke was flown to hospital in Adelaide, but was brain dead. Glenn and Jenny made the heartbreaking decision to turn off his life support. I still didn't want to turn that support off, but we did that together, myself and Jenny. Don't want to experience it again. You watch your child die, and part of you dies too. But Luke was not a victim of an assault. Police and forensic experts pointed to a vehicle. The investigation of Luke's death is... It's a criminal investigation into his death. Um, we're treating this as being a serious crime. Shane Ryan is the Shaw family lawyer. He's heard all the expert evidence surrounding Luke's death. The most probable thing that happened on that night is that Luke got a lift. He climbed uh, onto the back of a ute. Uh, the ute moved off and he fell from the ute onto the roadway and sustained fatal injuries. The injuries are consistent with someone falling from a considerable height or falling and hitting the roadway after being accelerated. So similar to putting a sock in a tennis ball, a tennis ball in a sock and swinging it, the ball will actually travel at a considerable greater speed in that circle and arc into whatever it strikes. The questions remain. Who was driving the car that night? Were there any passengers? Most critically, why didn't they stop to help? People leave scenes of collisions for many, many reasons, but generally they're quite simplistic. They're not, um, they're not difficult to understand. Uh, the driver could have been affected by alcohol or, or drugs. Um, it could be as simple as a driver being unlicensed. It could be as complex as persons in a stolen car um, or with some other sinister m motive behind why they're in the vehicle. And that's what Luke's mum, Jenny, believes. I hear a lot of rumours around and I, I am beyond thinking it was an accident. I am more thinking it's deliberate. Someone pushed him off a ute. Yes, out of a ute, yeah. because no matter drunk or not, you always try in some way to protect yourself. There's been no attempt for him to protect his body from hitting that ground. It's just full force to his head and that's what caused the extensive injuries he had. I definitely believe that somebody in the town or someone associated with Mildura back in October of 2005 knows what's happened, has been either been involved in what happened or can certainly assist us in finding those people. I feel guilty. I'm his mother, you know. Dad earns the money, Mum protects the children, and I haven't done that. 
What are you hoping for out of all of this? What, what would you like to achieve? Definitely closure. As a lot of people don't believe in the word closure, but until you lose a son or a loved one, you'll know what we mean. To go out and stand at Luke's grave and tell him, I now know what happened. Now you can rest peacefully because everyone will know what happened. That's the one thing I wish for. And then, then I can help the rest of them. But until I can go out there and tell him that, I can't. And now for the latest on the investigation into the death of Luke Shaw, we're joined by Detective Sergeant Mark Amos. Detective Sergeant, uh, after Luke's death, his family set up a Facebook page. You believe there may be some vital clues on that Facebook page. Tell us about that. As we saw, Jenny, uh, Jenny Shaw is very committed to solving the mystery of her son's death. And uh, in doing that, they've set up a Facebook page. In the last 12 months, uh, there's been a post put on that page by a person um, who either has a very good knowledge as a result of being involved or uh, knows people who were involved in the, uh, in the incident. And we'd be uh, appealing for that person to come forward to us, either through the program or Crime Stoppers, uh, and making themselves known to us so that we can get in touch with them and uh, have a listen to what they've got to say. So you believe this person may have either been at the scene or has been told something by somebody who was there? That's correct. We believe they've got a good understanding of what occurred. And what would you say to that person? Call Crime Stoppers, call the detectives? Call Crime Stoppers, call the program, call the Mildura Police, uh, call our office direct. It doesn't really matter. The information gets to us and we will be uh, making ourselves available to them. And what sort of difference could this piece of information make to the Shaw family? This could be the key that solves the mystery of Luke's death and uh, help perhaps uh, relieve the eight, near on eight year nightmare that the Shaw family's had to live through. All right, Detective Sergeant Mark Amos, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Neil. So, if you can provide any information about Luke's death, contact Crime Stoppers. And, of course, you can remain anonymous. When we return on Wanted, crooks on parade. The robbers caught on camera. Can you help identify them? Thanks for being with us on Wanted. Now to three people desperately missed by their families. Neil Hinckley was last seen on Umina Beach on the New South Wales Central Coast. That was on the 20th of December last year. Now Neil phoned his wife later that day to say that he was returning to their house at nearby Etalong. The father of three hasn't been seen since. Neil could be in northern New South Wales. Next is Matthias Lehman. Now, his parents haven't heard from him for more than a year. Matthias was last seen at Devonport in northern Tasmania on the 5th of August last year. It's believed he may have caught the Spirit of Tasmania ferry to Melbourne that day. And finally, Stephen Lockie. Stephen was last seen at Broadmeadows train station in Adelaide on the 11th of August in 1994. He has numerous tattoos and was living in the suburb of Kilburn when he went missing. Now, Stephen has five children. His four grandchildren were born after he disappeared. So to Neil, Matthias and Stephen, if you're watching this, please get in touch with your families and let them know you're OK. Now to more crimes caught on camera with Terry Dalton. Well, there's only one way to describe our first hold-up. It's a stick-up. In fact, it's a stick-up with a stick. That's what the crook is armed with when he walks into Bloom's Chemist on High Street in the outer Sydney suburb of Penrith. It's 8pm on Friday the 2nd of August. He demands cash and drugs. Eventually he's given what he wants and bolts off. He was last seen running down Woodruff Street. He's described as slim and about 180 centimetres tall. Next to a city convenience store in Sydney's King Street near the corner of Sussex Street. Two men enter just before midnight on Saturday, July 27. One man allegedly begins assaulting the attendant. Two other men then enter the store and join in the attack. All the men are described as Caucasian, in their mid-20s, around 180 centimetres tall and of average build. Some distinguishing features of the group include a right arm tattoo sleeve on this bloke, 
and a black hooded jacket with a white skull and crossbones on this one. Finally to the blokes who are after the dough at a Brisbane pizza joint. They enter the Buckland Street premises just on closing time on the 28th of July. They demand cash and while the employee opens the till, one stands guard and you can clearly see his gun. Police believe this hold up is linked to others committed around Brisbane on the same weekend. All three are wearing hoodies. Here we see the employee showing his wallet. As the bandits make off with the dough, we get another glimpse of the gun. Pulling a gun on someone is a serious crime. If you can help nab these guys, you know what to do. Thanks, Terry. Let's hope someone recognises them. Stay with us. After the break on Wanted, the latest on your calls to Crime Stoppers over tonight's cases. That's next on Wanted. With Wanted, now an update on the information coming into Crime Stoppers call centres right around the country. And for that, I'm joined by the director of the biggest Crime Stoppers call centre in Australia, Chris Beetson. Chris, has there been any information through to your team tonight that will be of use to detectives? Yes, Matt, we've got some good information both here in New South Wales and Victoria on the hit and run cases, uh, on the robbery uh, of the hotel in Melbourne, as well as uh, gun crime and the missing person. Gee, that's wonderful. So we've had some specific information on three or four of the cases that have been featured on the show. But beyond that, Chris, you mentioned some information too on crimes unrelated that viewers have called in about. That's right, Matt. One of the things that uh, comes from the program and inspires people to contact us tonight already, we've got some uh, really good information on, on some drug matters uh, and some other um, gun-related matters as well. That's a fantastic result. Chris, if there's someone who's watching and they might be... Uh, they might have information, but they're too afraid, say, to call in... What would you say to those people? Well, our operators, Matt, are, are highly skilled. They go through very extensive training. To deal with people who are under duress and maybe feeling a bit uh, nervous about contacting us, they'll talk you through, they'll ask you the right questions and, and help you remain anonymous. One of the things that they might like to look at in that case is reporting online as well, and that has actually doubled, that facility has doubled in recent times, is that right? That's right. We, we launched our online reporting through, particularly with smartphones and mobile phones, about 18 months ago. We've seen a significant rise, going from about 4,000 a year to uh, close to 10,000 reports online. That's incredible, and they can also use the facility to put images up there too as well. That's right. One of the features is that uh, you can give us both your video uh, and your photos you might take with uh, your applications. Thanks very much, Chris. We appreciate the update. Chris Beetson here at uh, Tugra Crime Stoppers. And if you can help, that Crime Stoppers number is 1800 333 000. You can also go online and, of course, you can remain anonymous. There's also our website if you need to catch up on our stories and get some further information. And you can follow the conversation on Twitter at WantedTVHQ. The hashtag is WantedTV. Now that just about wraps up Wanted for tonight. Next week, more on the hit and run death of John Stambolis in Melbourne 24 years ago. John was killed after being run down by someone driving a stolen car. Now after all that time, police are closing in on the driver. They've re-examined bloodstains found inside the car and have some new leads. That's something our forensic scientist, Anthony Mallett, will bring us next week as she continues her investigation. We now have a DNA profile of the, uh, the persons that we're interested in. This is going to be resolved, um, uh, not really if, um, it's a matter of when. That's just one of our stories at 8.30 next Monday. Until then, on behalf of the whole team, have a good night. And remember, evidence is everywhere. So if you see something, say something.